So the name of the podcast, uh, Alkistis, is The Big Questions. And every time I have somebody on, I always start it off by asking them what I think is probably one of the more, more difficult questions out there, which is, who are you? I am a being of light. <laughs> nice. Well, I feel like a being of light. I don't know if I am, but I feel like um, just someone who... Yeah, I just, light and dark, you know, you have to embrace both. Like the yin and yang sign you have, um, yeah. you know, it can't always be day, it's night and day. I like to think, you know, that I, I'm, I'm, I accept both, my dark side, I've healed a lot of my traumas, you know, and I love all my parts, you know. <laughs> That's good. That's where you want to get to in life, right? When you're uh, comfortable with who you are, warts and all. Yes. In terms of um, practical sort of uh, answers, uh, what's your name and what's your sort of vocation or your, uh, your, your career? Okay. My name is Alkistis Agio, and I see myself as someone who's like a teacher, uh, but also a student. And um, right now, I'm very focused on sharing about Greek philosophy, Stoicism, and the wisdom of Greek philosophy in general, the values of Greek philosophy. And um, my way of transferring that is through my guided meditations. Uh, my book, uh, the book is called From Fear to Freedom. And my online courses, coaching, everything is centered around helping people to move from a place of fear to a place of freedom, inner freedom, obviously, and just helping them make that transformation, that shift um, through Greek philosophy. That's, this is my tool. There are many tools. Other teachers use other tools. My tool is uh, sharing Greek philosophy wisdom, but also integrating it with techniques of uh, neuroscience, like what we've come to understand about the brain, and uh, especially the way I teach it in a, a kind of hypnotic state, the, the guided meditation goes very deeply in this way. Very cool. And uh, I mean, shifting uh, fear to freedom, I think is probably one of the most timely and important um, like lessons that you could be teaching right now as a human being, because it seems like the world is really gripped in a fear pandemic, doesn't it? It's true, there's a lot of anxiety, unknown factors. I mean, you know, it depends how you look at it. In ancient Roman times or ancient Greek time, uh, you know, they had a lot of insecurity, not knowing what would come tomorrow. There was hardly any insurance. There were wars, famine. I, I think, you know, every age has its insecurity, but our age seems to have a kind of neurosis about it, a kind of anxiety all the time, you know. And I can't say, I, don't, I didn't live in ancient Greece or Rome. Uh, I do like to see each the time that we're living in as part of the history of humankind. So I never say, you know, this is the worst time or this is the best time. It, I actually think we're living in one of the better times historically with most opportunities, most possibilities for the most amount of people. Now, I'm not saying not a lot of people suffering, but there has never been a time of more opportunity for learning, for growth, for professional opportunities you know it depends how you see it you know yeah, yeah. i'm not like over optimistic you know the we stoics are kind of like we look at things kind of rationally but from a loving perspective a loving kindness uh, as the buddhists say because there's a lot of similarities between buddhism and stoicism not all yeah. but many things uh, we have what what Plato calls the view from above, okay? The bird's eye view. And so I always like to look at the bigger picture. And so. Yeah, and that can be a, a really good practice, right? To try and look at things, not just from your really myopic sort of close-up perspective, but to take a step back and look at the, the big picture really um, can... 
Now, yeah. as I said, I was, I'm living in Greece. So in places like Greece or Rome and Italy, you can't see the history. You, can, you walk by and you see the ruins. Uh, you, you, you really see pictorially, visually, you really do realize you're just a blip on the screen of a much bigger picture. Yeah. I think in places like New York or, you know, the, the America, because it's a new continent, you know, a new civilization, you, you don't have that so much. But, you know, with some visits perhaps to some ancient ruins as, you know, you go to Mexico perhaps or Europe, it will really sink in this fact that people have been before you and mm. have been through what you've been through. And especially Greece, um, everything we've been through, anxiety, war, pandemic, um, they had. So that I, I like to draw from their wisdom and it can still be very useful today. It's much of modern psychology is based on Greek philosophy. Mm. CBT, especially cognitive behavioral therapy, the rational approach to analyzing. Um, it's, it's useful, it's eternal wisdom. I agree. Yeah, it's interesting to me. I, I didn't know the connection until recently that um, the founder of, was it REBT? He basically just took Epictetus's works and was like, well, this, this makes a lot of sense, right? <laughs> The, the slave, but you know, even Epictetus, Epictetus and the Stoics and all many schools like the Stoics, they, they were inspired by Socrates, like Socrates, mm. the big guru, if you like, although he never called himself a guru, when uh, told by the Delphic Oracle that he was the wisest of all people, he, he was very modest and said, you know, I know that I know nothing. I know very That's right. Nothing. Just beginning to learn about things. So Yeah, he set out to prove the Oracle wrong when 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 yeah. when they told him that, right? He he started asking all these people questions because he thought there's no way that I'm the wisest. So and then he realized, well, because I know I'm not wise, I guess I am kind of wise. <laughs> these yeah. other people yeah. don't know, right? But they pretend they do. So and he, and his life, um, you know, giving his life for his beliefs, mm -hmm. having been condemned to death for corrupting the youth. Uh, at the time of a kind of, um, there was a kind of dictatorship in Greece in, yep. at the time. So they put him on trial for corrupting the youth. He gave his life, you know, in the way that Jesus Christ, uh, but he never called himself a Messiah. Socrates always said, I'm a human being like you and what I learn, you can learn. He never deified himself or said, I'm the son of God. He was just a human being and says, we are human beings we, we can find our solutions. It's like a humanist approach. Yeah. And I think that this is why it's becoming popular again, Stoicism. It's risen again in popularity because I think um, a lot of people drift away from the church, the organized religion, and they're looking for another uh, path to uh, finding a quality of life, a, a balance of life. Uh, without necessarily having to believe in God, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and a Socratic approach, this rational self-reflection, self-questioning, self-inquiry, um, questioning your thoughts, um, knowing that we lie a lot to ourselves, we tell ourselves a lot of lies, there's a lot of self-deception. Uh, you know, things we, there's things we know we don't know, but there's a lot of things we don't know that we don't know, this, this obscure area. So this rational approach uh, really helps you to dismantle your false beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about it. You know, it's the work. It's a work that you do with yourself. And ultimately, it's love driven because a lot of people ask me, well, you know, it's, Where's the love? Where, where, where is it? It's not a lovey, touchy-feely type thing, but it's a, it's a real love for society and the world that you work on yourself. So it's not like I'm working on myself only for myself. I'm working for myself so I can flourish and then return to society and, and help society. And it's not the egotistical base, self-help, you know? 
Yeah, no, I, yeah, I totally get that. So basically, is, is it safe to say that the uh, fundamental part of your approach is the Socratic method or Socratic inquiry? Is that kind of the driving vehicle? Yes, I have uh, my book, um, Here to Freedom. I can't uh, show, you, show you now, but the book has inside my method. The method is, is really a step-by-step -step, uh, self-inquiry that you can process any fear, any anger, any frustrating thought. You may be having a frustrating thought lately that doesn't allow you to sleep well, it wakes you up in the middle of the night, the anxiety. There's a, a compulsive thought. Okay, what is this compulsive thought? And you ask yourself, you know, is this thought really true? Is it, maybe I'm dramatizing, maybe I'm taking it too personally, maybe I'm, you know, it's this checking yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find that, you know, if you just go with the first impression or the first uh, judgment that your mind produces, you're probably not going to have a good time. <laughs> you know, it kind of leads you along uh, a lot of established patterns, right? That's right. You, you don't have, you mustn't believe yourself. We tell ourselves a lot of lies and a lot of self-deception, a lot of preconceptions, cognitive bias, cultural bias, lots of, yeah. lots of ways. And if you really want to be free, if you really want to be free, you have to do that self-processing. No one's going yeah. to do it for you. I mean, a good therapist can help you by ask, prompting you. This is what Socrates he did. He just exactly. prompted questions like, is it true? And why is it true? How are you sure? Do you have some proof for this? And, you know, where's the source of your proof? And uh, is this practical? Is this logical? Is this going to help you? How is this going to help you? You know, just asking questions, you know, scientific yeah. method. We, we, the Greeks basically created the scientific method where you have to prove your theory about things. That's right. Find yeah, the pre-Socratics were, were all over that, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Inspires me to give to share the tools with people, these practical tools, or just to listen to my guided meditations, where I create uh, I create an experience. I like to give people experience in the guided meditations. Yeah. Um, why do you think? You know, you said we we lie to ourselves a lot. Where do you think that comes from? Um, like. How come so many of us are so good at deceiving ourselves and how come it's so hard for us to question ourselves? Like what you're describing, I've been doing for several years, but when I talk to people about it, most of the time they need someone to ask the question. So like you were saying, a good therapist, it, mm -hmm. it seems to be hard for people to actually question themselves directly without some kind of help. So like, is that tied into the self-deception? Well, what is that all about? Certainly it's helpful to have someone prompt you with questions or to go through a worksheet as in my book. It's mm -hmm. like a workbook and I prompt you in the book or in my guided meditations, I prompt you and I leave space. I leave space. I, I say, for example, once I've put you in a, in, induced you into a relaxed state, then I say, okay, now what is the thought that's, uh, you know, as if you were here with me yeah. next to me, I say, okay, what is the thought that's frustrating you most? What's not letting you sleep? What's gotten you angry this week, today, you know? And then I, I shut up. I don't say anything. I give you space, this quiet space. A little prompting. This is my, my tools are to assist people to do self-reflection. I love technology. It can, can you know, you can use it to, to, to even observe yourself. You know, I worked a lot and still do, but for many years I worked as a, a management trainer, a leadership trainer, and I use video a lot because, you know, we talk about self-reflection, but, you know, you can use a camera to self-reflect too. You just, uh, you know, when you're in an argument, just turn your, your own phone on, just put it on you and watch yourself play a wonderful role as you go through <laughs> your anger. You know, you do you, <laughs> you do how you do anger. And then you watch yourself on the video. You know, I, I, you can use technology for self-reflection. You don't have to do everything in your own mind, in your own yeah. brain, you know. So you can use technology to relax you, for example, with music lists, 
or guided meditation, you know, on your phone. You know, technology is, empowers you. You can use it to empower you. Yeah. So. It can be a distraction or it can empower you, but it comes down to how you use it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I, I've i um, had success with journaling because I find that that uh, helps to get the thoughts out of my head and onto a page. But um, yeah, there's so many different ways that you can engage with yourself. And it's uh, it's strange to me that... Different um, medium. Different medium. Yeah. And uh, people need to find the, the medium for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think what it comes back to for me is nobody ever told me when I was a kid that I had a relationship with myself mm-hmm. that that I was not my thoughts and that I could engage with my thoughts as if they were not my own and question them and all that stuff. And so I think what, what you're doing here is you're maybe helping people realize that for the first time. I don't think I'm very original. The only thing I'm, I know I'm original in is guided meditations, uh, like self hypnosis combined with Greek philosophy. Yeah. There's a lot of people teaching Greek philosophy, but not in this state of alpha mode of a kind right. of lucid, lucid dreaming and taking them into a visualization. I, I you know, I'm a creative person. I like to create things. And uh, yeah, I like to teach people to, to create their own tools and, and either video or painting or dancing or massage all things, using all things to, to free yourself of all this unnecessary baggage so that you can liberate your energy instead of wasting it on toxicity and negativity to use it for your own healing, healing others and making money or whatever else you would like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't hurt to make a little bit of money here and there, right? Keep the roof over your head. Well, you know, for me, money is energy, you know, and yeah. you, you want to focus some of your energy to create, ener- to create, you know, affluence, create wealth in all its yeah. forms, you know, all its forms. Yeah. Well, really I mean, freeing your energy from wasting it on unnecessary melodrama. <laughs> yeah. And there's lots of that. All the, oh, me, poor me. And then the melodrama. Yeah. And I'm not saying that people don't have problems. Of course they do, they have serious problems. But when you look to people like Epictetus or, uh, you know, who was a slave and who later went on to found a school of philosophy, you see living examples of people who have overcome great difficulties. They inspire you to say, okay, you know, my problem is not big. This yeah, Vi- Victor Frankl is the guy for me. Anytime I've got an issue, it's like, just think of Victor. Right, like Victor in the concentration camp. Yeah, your little problem. problems go beep. <laughs> I grew up with my father, you know, who uh, taught me about stoicism, and he was um, from 15 years old. You know, the German, the SS, they 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 burned his village in Sparta, and um, he went to, to fight in the against the resistance, the resistance, the Greek resistance against the Nazis you know, a very dramatic life. And he was for me, like always showing me that, look, your, your life is so easy, you, you know, everything, these, these problems are small. Uh, what I have been through, he's been through very difficult things. So, you know, you have to have people who, you know, really open your eyes to how small your melodrama is. Yeah, and they, they also teach us that you don't have to again, accept the story that you've been telling yourself. You don't have to accept anything. You, you can make it what you will, even in the most dire, painful circumstances imaginable. You can turn those circumstances into something beautiful. Yes. Right? And uh, I think that's what the art of living is really all about, is taking the raw materials that life has given you and creating a masterpiece out of your whole life. Yeah. Or at least die trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you're good. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, you're putting it together. You may never reach the masterpiece, but sure. you're trying and you're, you know, this is your aim. This is the Stoics call this, you are a prokopton, which means like a, an initiate, a trainee. You're a practitioner. You are yeah. in, in the making. So, of course, you're going to keep making some mistakes, but they will get smaller and smaller. You're not going to fall into those traps so easily. 
You know, you're going to be like, okay, been there, done that. I'm not going down that rabbit hole again. And this frees you. It frees up your energy. It frees up your health and well-being. And you can really enjoy here your life. So uh, just to ask you for the viewers, how, how do you define inner freedom, which is what you're kind of uh, offering to people with your books and your meditation? So what would you describe it as to somebody who maybe has never heard that term? Well, inner I think everybody has a sense of what freedom feels like, you know, whether it be a physical freedom, like the sense of flying or freedom is this opening of yourself, the opening, you know, widening it's a feeling freedom is a feeling yeah. freedom fulfillment it's it's a feeling and we all have glimpses of it but you just want more of it you want to keep that sustaining that but practically speaking like freedom for me is the freedom of choice mm. you know, like i just said someone throws something at you what you're how you're going to perceive it is your main freedom how I perceive anything that's coming at me or happening. And there's just, you know, the freedom to switch perspective into yeah. a perspective that empowers you. Uh, yeah. The freedom to, 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 to switch to a state of forgiving, to say, I'm not going to hold this hatred anymore or this bitterness. I'm going to forgive him. I'm going to understand that he too was abused he too went through something or she too is, hmm. has some trauma she's working through. That freedom of getting unstuck. That's, I want that freedom. I don't want external circumstances to control me. Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. And you, Socrates is a prime example of that, right? I mean, he, he literally <laughs> you know, was given an out, right? They said, just plead guilty and you can go. And he was like, chug, chug, chug. <laughs> right. He goes, you know, I, I fought for civilization and justice. And you can't just ignore the laws. If you want to change the laws, you have to go through the parliament, go through the government, become a lawyer, become an activist. But, you know, the law is the law and you have to uh, obey it. You know, this is what the judgment is. So he didn't want to contradict himself. He wanted to embody his values. That's right. So, but yeah, we, he had a free choice to, to do it. And he died with as he wanted to see himself. So it's that freedom that we have mainly in our mind, you know. To yeah. exercise our freedom of choice, of perspective. They call this proeresis. Proeresis is when you, before you react, you, you can have a little gap. You have this little gap of, I don't know, 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, before you, you know, you see a chocolate cake, you want to eat, okay. But you have already had sweets and you say, Okay, if I still want it in 10 minutes, you know, you give yourself that little gap, that gap yeah. between event and reaction, you have, that's where you exercise your freedom. It's like a 10 second gap. And that makes all the difference. Yeah, that's the, uh, I think you just basically almost quoted uh, Viktor Frankl there between stimulus and response lies a space and in that space is your freedom to choose, right? Yeah. This is what the Aristotle called proeresis. Just yeah. reflect on your perspective, reflect on what you're seeing, because you're not, might be an illusion, a projection. Mm -hmm. And that is so liberating. You know, it's, it just frees up, frees you from wasting your time and energy and actually just giving out the completely different signals to the world. So you attract a different signals too. You attract a different reality from just switching your perspective. Yeah. And that's what I think, you know, when you hear about the law of attraction uh, and things of that nature, manifestation and things like that, I think that that's all really coming back down to that, what you're describing here, which is when you change your mindset or you change your uh, attitude, your basically like, tuning to different frequencies and you're going to notice different things and different things are going to happen as a result. It's not magic. It's not like you're conjuring wealth or any of these things. It's just you're yeah. aligning yourself with your truth and the way things are, right? Yes. This is it. You know, why do I have to embellish things and, you know, say it's some kind of some something else? It's you. You have that power. We have that power. This is our human power. You don't have to be beyond a human or be a something yeah this is a, a power we have so 
you don't have to, you know, there's nothing more beautiful than reality. You know, you don't have to say it's miraculous or, I mean, I'm just saying that you can just exercise your, your mind. You know, this is what a great power and we're not exercising it. We're not taught to, to do that in school. I think it should be one of the first things they teach in school, this emotional intelligence, these yeah tools and skills maybe now in schools they're doing it more but we never had that in school you know although i had yeah. a school i good schools i was in canada very advanced but they didn't teach us like basic like you know stress management yeah. well, why, why did i have to wait till i was you know 15 to join a yoga class to figure that out you know yeah um, meditation things like that for sure should be taught it was early about on. grades and getting grades and passing the no one no one really asked you questions. I think the first time a teacher asked me, what do you think was in high school? You know, and oh. I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, but the teacher was asking me my opinion. I, was like, I didn't know what to answer. Yeah. <laughs> it was the first time a teacher asked me. So I think we need to, to, to give the, the, the young people this, these skills. It's so important. I love the older people too, but if you start young, it becomes a habit. You know, why did I have to go through all this drama and trauma and not have really this, the tools, you know? Yeah, could, I couldn't agree more. And it's so simple too, right? When you would break it down and even something as simple as the, uh, the, 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 the pyramid of thinking, feeling and doing that they teach you in, in CBT and stuff like just that alone is a game changer, right? Yeah, so this is why I'm so like passionate about sharing tools and skills, the best of what I've come across. And um, this is what I'm all about, making it practical, making it effective, easy uh, for anyone. You know, it doesn't, you know, people used to relate philosophy with high academia. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, Epictetus was a slave, Marcus Aurelius was an emperor, and the whole gamma in between, you know, the whole range, Everyone can practice uh, philosophy, self-reflection. So, yeah, but that's the key word is practice, right? And when you go to academia, you find a lot of people studying philosophy, but not practicing philosophy. And I, I made that mistake in college, took an introductory philosophy class and was completely turned off the whole topic. And then about seven or eight years later, discovered Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism and was like, holy crap, this is real philosophy. Yeah, so simply put, it speaks to you, human to human, mm -hmm. simple. Yeah, well, and, and, and I think the academic philosophy could have practical values for people, but because people just think of it as something that you study, they don't really consider the possibility of putting it into motion in your own life. So it ends up being kind of a, an exercise in, in you know, intellectual futility, you're just memorizing yeah. stuff. Yeah. That's right. So did you did you go to um, did you take, do your education in philosophy or were you uh, trained in a different field or? I started um, in finance, corporate finance, a completely different field. I mean, I always wanted to study philosophy, but um, at that time, you know, I was. Everyone says like, "What are you going to do with philosophy? You 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 will starve." You know, what are you going to do? You. Philosophy, you can always read it. You don't have to study it. Just read books all your life. Yeah. And they said, do something practical, especially my father. He said, you know, he had been through so many wars and dramas. And he said, you know, you need a steady job in your life. So I originally studied finance and banking. And then at some point I had like, uh, you know, I knew it wasn't for me when I was in the bank. I, I just, uh, at some point it built up in me and I left my job at the bank and I had a very big argument with my father. I left the house in a dramatic uh, exit and I, I took like time off. I traveled, I went to Turkey, traveled throughout Turkey up until Iraq and uh, you know, Mount Ararat and I went to Italy after I traveled and was looking for myself. I was just doing odd jobs from waitressing to teaching yoga to slowly I discovered leadership training, management training, like teaching things so in training programs. And I slowly went, oh, you can use psychology and philosophy uh, in a practical way. It's not just 
you know, I, I discovered slowly by myself and went back to university, did the master in psychology and a PhD in philosophy. And I finally fulfilled my dream after many years, 10 years it took me. And um, I was able both to earn an income from what I loved and because basically where I was teaching to the, to the executives, I was teaching them the uh, Aristotle's method and Socratic method, which is uh, very modern and very current of self-reflection, self-questioning, uh, even the art of persuasion. You know, Aristotle was the first to uh, teach the art of persuasion. It was mm -hmm. the first manual ever written. And this system is still taught today. Um, the rhetorical triangle. That's right. Logos. So I was teaching it and making money and I was like, I, and I, I had found my thing. It took me a while, but I found my thing. So, and I continue to study and learn. That's all. Well, you're, you're so blessed, I mean, to be able to do this uh, and to support yourself while doing it. That's obviously something that you're passionate about. So, I mean, that's the dream I'm in my opinion. I'm familiar with, uh, with philosophy, but you know, you can, if, you, if you're helping people to change their life, if you're offering a valuable service, you can get paid too, you know. Yeah. Yeah, as long as you can sustain yourself. I mean, to me, it's like, way. you know. There's a way. There is a way for everyone to, to if, they, if they like philosophy or psychology, as long as you're serving also others, you're offering yeah. a service, you, you, will, you will be able to sustain yourself in, in a reasonable way, you know. So I'm, I'm happy. I feel very blessed, but I also feel like, you know, I put in the effort. I took my risks. I, I left the comfort zone and yeah. it, it was a struggle. It was sometimes very dangerous and difficult and, but I'm pleased now. Yeah. It seems to have worked out for you, which is awesome. Um, you mentioned your dad introducing you to stoicism. So is that where your sort of, um, uh, your your love of that particular school comes from? Uh, yes. I mean, he introduced me to Greek philosophy in general. You know, he had a very big library mm -hmm. and he would always, you know, give me teachings and visiting archaeological sites. And he was like wanting to, you know, give me this Greek philosophy he, he, from young. And, you know, when I was a teenager, then he would give me this book or we would sit in, in his library he offered me a glass of cognac. I don't know for Americans if that seems strange, but we Europeans <laughs> were okay with wine and cognac <laughs> from a young age. And, um, you know, over a glass of cognac, we would discuss, and he would tell me his war stories and how he went to prison and concentration camp and all these things and how it all helped him. So he both embodied the principles and he gave me the books too. Right. And, no, I, it was a nice uh, introduction. It was like, I was lucky to have that, I believe. Yeah, and you took to it. It wasn't like, because I know some people, like I have a friend whose father was uh, yeah. always talking about this kind of stuff. And for her, it turned her off of it. And so like, anytime I talk about it around her, she's like, you sound like my dad. She doesn't, <laughs> because it was like always in her face as a kid, right? So for you, you, you yeah. didn't feel that way. There was a bit of that too. Like, oh, okay, dad. you know, sometimes it was like too much. <laughs> I love the stuff. It was just yeah. You know, he wasn't um, what, you know, his father was an Orthodox priest and he went kind of against that, his rebel, rebel, revolution, I don't know what you call it. Um, he didn't, he wasn't, he didn't want to be in the Orthodox Christianity, the religion path. He looked to the ancient Greeks for his inspiration. It was like the 70s, 60s, 70s, you know, it was a generation that, that was modernizing and they, they freed themselves a little from tradition, you know, those kind of like going to church every time and just taking the dogma. And I'm not mm -hmm. criticizing Greek orthodoxy, but he just decided he would find his wisdom and his uh, direction and values through the ancients. That was a, a different, like most of my classmate or Greek classmates, they were very, you know, church ridden you know mm -hmm. so you know it depends you're influenced by your parents a lot you know yeah i was like that yeah it's it's interesting too that um that christianity was heavily influenced by stoicism aristotle yeah. and all those guys absolutely plato platonism yeah. 
um, Plato was the most like metaphysical type uh, of a philosopher with a cave and he believed mm -hmm. that our body was a kind of a virtual reality suit that this is a simulated reality that we see that we perceive through our senses that we shouldn't be deceived by our senses that part of him was very metaphysical and the christians liked that they liked that you know don't trust your body and the senses aim for the spiritual dimensions yeah i think i like eclectic I like to choose from Plato things. I like to, to choose from, so I like to, you know, choose from, from Christianity, I, uh, from Buddhism, from, I, I followed, I went to an ashram for a while. I studied yoga and Hinduism yeah. and Sufis. I lived with the Sufis in Turkey for a while wow. with this monastery. So, you know, you can get from everywhere eclectically. Have you noticed that all of these different schools, like the Sufis, uh, you know, like the, the the Vedic philosophy, have you noticed that they there's a lot of parallels for you in terms of, of what you're reading and what you're finding? Or is it just kind of picking and choosing? I think, you know, all wisdom gravitates to certain principles like res love and respect, loving kindness, uh, objective thinking, kind of Yep. Pulling yourself away from the screen and pulling yourself over view. There's this similarity of remaining equanimity, yeah. you know, harnessing the passions, um, harnessing, not suppressing. That's right. Harnessing, you know, guiding. Yeah, steering. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, it's not so much the teachings, but the people I have met, great teachers who embodied uh, I always looked for teachers who embodied their teachings. Hmm. Um, and I, I, I went an extra mile always to look behind the scenes. Maybe I got that from my father. It was like, don't look at only the outside. Look, what are they doing in their personal life? Oh, yeah. Where are they living their values? You know, I looked beyond. I, was, I didn't just worship a guru. You know, I would say, you know, how does he treat his wife? How? You know, how is he treating, how is he in a personal life? I yeah. need a teacher who is, has integrity. I, I look a little, you know, I want, I want to really believe in, in, in a teacher and the teacher will, must embody these principles. So I often volunteered so I can see them in other, not only when they're teaching on a podium, but I wanted to see behind this. And many of them kind of disappoint you or, you know, you're like, okay, he's only human. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's good because it shows you that you can also become a teacher or you too can, can be even better than your teachers. You can, you know, it's not like um, anyone else is better than you. you know? Sure. But I was always looking for strong teachers and I was lucky to, to find good teachers along the way, people who inspired me. I'm inspired by great people. <laughs> yeah, well, you're very lucky to have met even one such person. I feel like they're probably uh, in short order. I agree. I, I've met some very powerful teachers in my life. I mean, and they just, they're spiritual teachers, but there's also other teachers, you know, your grandmother, your grandfather, <laughs> your aunt, your great uncle, I don't know. There's people you meet who, yeah. who par and share their, share their wisdom. But I always liked philosophy. You know, it was always the thing I loved from the beginning. I just didn't have the self-confidence to, to start it from the beginning. But, you know, there you go. Everyone has to do their, go through the labyrinth and find their way out, you know, without, totally. you, you don't know. So who knows if I would have studied from the beginning philosophy. I, I'm happy with the way it, it all worked out. <laughs> Well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who knows? I mean, if you maybe if you had started out studying it, it would have turned you off like it did for me. I exactly. mean, it's exactly. I would have maybe thought, oh, this is so too stuffy, you know. So Descartes brain in a vat, like that's not the best way to jump into philosophy. <laughs> yeah, and maybe you wouldn't have the most inspiring teacher, your philosophy yeah. professor. No, so I think everything just worked. I think I want to say that to anyone who's listening and watching that. Anything you want, the experience, look for the experience you want beyond the outer thing. Look what is the really experience you're looking for. And that you can have. 
you can find that experience within this lifetime. You might not be able to achieve the external goals that you want, but if you find an experience that you're looking like, look for experiences like you're wanting peace, you're wanting freedom, you want to experience love, you want to experience appreciation, gratitude, wonder, whatever are those experiences, those you can have for sure. Like I can't guarantee you that you will have, you know, uh, live in a mansion by the end of your life if this is your goal. But what does that mansion represent for you? Right. Perhaps it represents comfort. Perhaps it, it represents security. Look for where you can find comfort and security as a direct experience, as, you, as, a, as a way of thinking, as a way of being. And this is available to anyone. Yeah. So you can find your fulfillment. I believe that, you know, if you really love yourself and you, you, you know, you're looking to find peace and harmony, there's a way to that. There is a way to that for everyone to access. It's yeah. not a question of wealth. I'm not saying that a little wealth and comfort doesn't help. Of course, you know, if you're a coal working in a coal mine or you're a child slave, it's not going to be really that easy. Not that it's impossible, as we have seen by people like Gandhi or Nelson Mandela or other, you know, uh, role models. Mm -hmm. But really look for the inner experience you're wanting. And this is within your reach. Nothing can stop you from that. Nothing can stop you from uh, going into that place, that inner citadel, the inner castle, the kingdom within, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. No, one can, no one can take that away from you. So yeah. I think you know, that's where you need to build your, your inner kingdom, your inner space that no one can penetrate, no one can destroy. Yeah. I mean, what it sounds like what you're saying is that people think they want certain things, but what they're really after is the feeling or the experience of that comes from having that thing. Right. Oh. So like, oh. uh, you know, the mansion, it's like, well, it's not really the mansion that you're after. It's the feeling of being comfortable, successful, whatever comes with it's the mansion. Loved, admired. You can find, yeah. you can get admiration by just doing something nice for someone, you know, surprising them, making their day. You don't have to, because oftentimes the material thing will disappoint you. When you have almost it, always. You have, almost always, yes. Yeah, yes. especially if there's a lot of uh, anticipation. In my experience, if you, you've been building it up for a while and then it, it comes through and you get it, it's like, oh, that's it. Now it's over. <laughs> uh, yeah. This is why I like that saying that they say life, uh, happiness is a journey, not a destination. Yeah. Uh, this, you know, it's that cultivating that place of happiness within you, that place of self-healing, um, you know, making time. And this is why I offer the guided meditations because I want to help people to do that because I know they're so busy and so anxious. So I, I like to offer my guided meditations to facilitate that. And then they can create even their own if they like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I like that. I like that you kind of give people um, a guideline or a template that they can use to create their own sort of uh, rituals and their own practices. It's not just like you have to follow my way. This is like you're just offering kind of a, a toolkit. Exactly. Prompting, leaving yeah. space for them to answer. And it's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful thing. Well, I'm going to make sure to include a link to your YouTube channel and to your book uh, in the comments below because, uh, well, first of all, I want to read your book now. <laughs> it sounds like a pretty, uh, pretty awesome one. So uh, thanks a lot. Summary. There's a free summary on my book, on my website. There's a yep. free condensed summary, you know, for anyone who wants to access the, the, the crux, you know, the real core yeah. of the message. It's for free there. It's also a free uh, get meditation. I offer the free meditations and every week on YouTube, practically I upload. So I'm offering a lot of things for free as a pleasure. Yeah. It's a pleasure. It's a giving. And I have patrons from Patreon, but I like giving things for free. It makes me feel good. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, my, my wife is, uh, uh, follows a lot of, um, different like doctors and health practitioners online. And, and what we've noticed from these folks is that some of them will give you, uh, they'll like talk to you about the problem and then they'll be like, now come to my website and buy all these programs. And they give you nothing, no hint of a solution, nothing. Whereas 
you, to me, it shows that you're not just in it for profit. You're actually trying to help people and you're willing to even give some of it away. To me, that's a sign right. of, of somebody who's doing it from the right place. Right. I've been given so much. So, you know, it's the least I can do. I wish yeah. I could do more. But really, I, I, I really, I, I ask that the universe give me the opportunity to, to help more and more people and myself. But it's really a great joy when someone writes you an, a small note and says, you know, it helped me so much. It's such a big feeling. So it's, it's not, you can't get paid for it. The, the money is not, uh, I mean, it's a, a, a valuable feeling, a, a deep, yeah. fulfilling feeling. So, but yeah. uh, everything flows, everything's happening fine. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to read your book. A nice feeling. I get this very peaceful feeling from you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've... I, your podcast, your interviews, you, you know, you're, you're sharing the love, you're sharing the life. It's beautiful. Yeah, I just love having these types of conversations with people. Don't have a lot of people in my uh, in my job or in my surroundings that I can engage with at this level. So anytime I meet someone, I love to uh, have these types of, of discussions. So it's been great. You too, Ollie.